Yo, what's up guys? Welcome to Digital Arts USMRE. Today we're going to continue with our microbiology. Specifically, we're going to cover Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Its characteristics, virulence factors, the organ systems affected by it, and the treatment options based on the type of infection. And while we're at it, we can cover some of the mechanisms of action based on the antibiotics we're using against it. So what is Staph saprophyticus? Well, it's a gram-positive staphylococci and a facultative anaerobe, similar to Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis. So when we go through the four-step process of staining, it looks purple with a bunch of cocci everywhere. They're just like these grape-like clusters that are like pumping up everywhere. It's also catalase positive. So just remember this test differentiates staph from strep and it turns hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So the next step is to differentiate Staphylococcus saprophyticus and Staphylococcus epidermidis from Staphylococcus aureus. The way we do that is the coagulus test. So in this case, both Staph epidermidis and Staph saprophyticus are coagulus negative, aka cons. So after we differentiate those two, now we just need to differentiate Staphylococcus epidermidis from Staphylococcus saprophyticus. And we can use a Nova Biosyn test, which is just a weak antibiotic. We usually take a urine sample and place it onto a Nova Biosyn dish and check the growth that around it afterwards. So the reason why we do a urine sample is because we're usually testing women with UTIs. They have Staph saprophyticus. So Staph saprophyticus is Nova Biosyn resistant. That's how we will differentiate it from Staph epidermidis. So yeah, just a little bit of where Staphylococcus saprophyticus lives. It lives on our skin, nose, and for girls, vagina. So the big problem with Staphylococcus saprophyticus is that it can cause UTIs and Huntington cystitis. It's usually in sexually active women, like really sexually active. Just remember, it's not the number one cause of UTI. The number one cause of UTIs actually comes from E. coli. So we can differentiate Staphylococcus saprophyticus and E. coli by doing a UA, which is urine analysis. This UA basically consists of a whole bunch of tests on the urine. The first thing for all UAs is to get a clean catch. So that means when we get our UA results back, we see very few squamous cells. And one of the tests performed as part of the UA is a nitrite test. So normally our urinary tract is free of bacteria, but there are certain types of bacteria like E. coli, which can turn our nitrate, which is normally produced by our body and inside the urine to nitrite. In this case, Staphylococcus epidermidis is nitrite negative. So that makes our life pretty good. Also, just because the nitrite test comes back negative does not mean that you can rule out the UTI. You must also compare this with the white blood cells and the cytosterase test and the clinical presentation as well. So we'll usually see some pretty high white blood cells in the urine along with pretty high leukocyte esterase. And leukocyte esterase is just like an enzyme within the WBCs. It can indicate if there's like some inflammation in the urinary tract, whether it's in like the bladder or the kidney. So these patients will present differently based on where their infection is located anatomically. If they have urethritis, the inflammation is just going to be limited to like the urethra. And they'll only have some dysuria, just pain when they pee. For cystitis, that's an infection of bladder mucosa. So the bacteria usually have to climb up a little bit higher. So Staph saprophyticus, that's what it's usually known for. It's the honeybee cystitis. So these patients have dysuria, which will lead to urgency and frequency. So that just means that they're gonna have to keep on peeing because they can't void all at once because they're gonna have like a ton of pain when they void. So along with this, they'll also have some super pubic tenderness since the bladder mucosa is inflamed. And plus that's where it's located anatomically. They'll have some pyuria as well, which is just like white blood cells in the urine. And if the bacteria climb up higher, then you'll get another complication, which will be pyelonephritis, which is pretty bad. So pyelonephritis has the same symptoms as cystitis, along with a fever. They might have some back pain or flank pain as well. In the physical exam, they will have costovertebral anglo tenderness. That thing like pronounce that. Costovertebral angle tenderness. Basically, they have CVA tenderness. And it's just when you punch the patient in the kidney and they feel some pain. 
Oops, don't punch the mic too hard. Also, on your UA, you'll see white blood cell casts. And these casts are usually formed from the distal convoluted tubule or the collecting duct of the nephron. They are not formed in the proximal convoluted tubule. This is just because a lot of the water is pretty much reabsorbed in the descending glucose, so it becomes pretty concentrated after that point. And you can see like the osmolarity just spike up and it's just like skyrocketing like at that point like, down there. Um, you'll also see some organisms growing in the culture, like once you get the cultures and sensitivities back. And if it gets really bad, then the patient could get perinephric abscess, which is just an abscess outside the renal capsule, but within Giorta's fascia. So you guys are probably like, what the hell is Giorta's fascia? I can't even pronounce it right. It's like Giorta's fascia. I don't even know how the hell to pronounce it. Anyways, the Giorta's fascia is just some connective tissue that wraps around the kidney the kidneys adipose tissue and the adrenal glands so if this happens you're pretty much screwed because it's like really bad and yeah so they're gonna have an abscess and pus in the rhodas fascia so after you get your ua the easiest thing to do is to get like an imaging test and the fastest imaging test that you can get out there is an ultrasound test which is done pretty fast and it's not invasive so you do that first and then if you want to get some better results and see where the abscess is exactly then you could do like a ct scan and that might help interventional radiology in draining the abscess once you find the abscess you must drain it and once you drain it, of course, you're going to get a culture and you'll see the organism grow. And then you can find which antibiotic it's sensitive to. So for staph saprophyticus, the main treatment option is using fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, or moxifloxacin. They work by inhibiting the DNA gyrase, which is like this enzyme within the class of topoisomerase. And it can either target topoisomerase 2 or if you use like one of the new ones, the fourth generations, then it can go after topoisomerase 4. And the job is basically to prevent supercoils in the DNA. And a lot of you guys are probably like, what the hell is supercoils? So basically what it means is like, say for example, you have a phone cord and you're trying to straighten out one end of the cord. Well, if you look at the other end, you'll see it just keeps getting tighter and tighter and it'll become very super coiled. So, in order to relieve this supercoil, we have like these topoisomerases, which can unwind the supercoil DNA and prevent too much stress on them. Because if there's like too much stress, then they're gonna break. So, these antibiotics work by inhibiting the topoisomerases. So, there's a bunch of stress on the DNA, and that's how it breaks by using fluoroquinolones. So, a few of the side effects of these fluoroquinolones, especially superfloxacin is tendon rupture and you also want to avoid using it in pregnant patients because it can damage the cartilage in the kids. You can also use phenazopyridine which can help relieve the symptoms of UTI. It acts as a local analgesic. It will change your urine to like a dark orange color but that's like nothing really to worry about. Also it can turn other body fluids orange so if the patient wears contact lenses you want to tell them to hold off for a while until they're done taking the drug. Otherwise, yeah, they're gonna stain their contact lenses orange and that's gonna be bad. So another way to manage their UTI is by using cranberry capsules. Now remember, I said cranberry capsules, not cranberry juice. So this can help decrease the prevalence of UTIs as well. So if they have a UTI, it's probably not gonna be that useful, but if you wanna help prevent it, then it's gonna be useful. The cranberry capsules work because they're just really concentrated and they have the equivalent strength of about two eight ounce servings of cranberry juice. And yeah, cranberry juice by itself will just help hydrate you, but the effects of actually preventing the bacteria to adhere to the bladder wall will not work because it's just not that concentrated enough and the active ingredients in the cranberry is pretty much long gone by the time it reaches your bladder. So the reason why the cranberry capsules work is because it contains this A-type proanthrocyanidins, which make it hard for the bacteria to stick to your mucosa. So yeah, this is Staphylococcus saprophyticus in a nutshell, with some of the UTI complications and most effective drugs used against it. So if you have any comments, suggestions, or anything else you'd like to see, just leave a comment below. Also, remember to like and subscribe. 
and thanks again for watching. All right, see you guys later.